For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. This is Stat News Global. I'm Amitabh Ravi. We're discussing Prime Minister Kishida's visit to India with India's former envoy to Japan, Deepak Gopal and Vadva. Basu, thanks so much for your time. A lot of momentum building, but you, would you say that after the last year, there have been several meetings between the two Prime Ministers, Prime Minister Modi's travel there for former Prime Minister Abe's state funeral, the Quad meeting was on as well. Is it moving the momentum enough to your liking? Well, I think they're keeping up the momentum, and that's really important, the fact that you mentioned so many meetings. Uh, and if you remember, last year we celebrated the 70th anniversary of our establishment of diplomatic relations. And we had a slew of events over the years. And plus we had these very important visits. But I think perhaps uh, all were significant, but very much so Prime Minister Kishida's first ever visit abroad was to India for the summit last March, exactly a year ago. And then of course he met Prime Minister Modi again, uh, you know, for the court summit. And then Prime Minister Modi was one of the important uh, global leaders who went for the state funeral of Prime Minister Abe, with whom he shared a very special relationship. And, you know, keeping up with this momentum now, you find that Prime Minister Kishida has decided to come again uh, just a year later. And of course, now, besides the bilateral dialogue, which continues, and, uh, you know, these are opportunities for them to review what has happened in the past year, look at the new areas of priorities, um, look where they should be going together. There's an additional element this year, which is the fact that both the countries are uh, chairing the G7 and the G20 respectively. So this is an additional point in the agenda, and I think which is why uh, this visit has been quite significant. You look at that dynamic, the G70 and the G20 leadership. Now India again positioning itself, not only for its own interest, but as global south voice, uh, Japan on the same side as the US, the West, the G7 when it comes especially to the Russia-Ukraine war and uh, Prime Minister Kishida mentioned it several times on how strong their stance is. How do you see all of that sitting with our position especially when there is a commonality of the China factor? Well, I think in the context of the G7 and G20 when uh, both the Prime Ministers met I think it provided them an opportunity to explain to the other and elaborate on their own respective agendas and priorities, you know. And uh, certainly, I personally see convergence in the fact that we are now giving voice to the Global South and we want to bring focus back onto the development agenda in the world, you know, to look back at the issues of the existing development issues plus the additional new areas such as climate change and the other challenges before the developing world. And very interestingly, uh, you find that uh, Prime Minister Kishida yesterday, when he was talking about his sort of new vision for, for the free and open Indo-Pacific, he talked a lot at length about the Global South. So I would think the fact of bringing attention to the needs of the Global South would certainly be one point of convergence. In, what, in the larger perspective of things. But both of us have our own priorities. We come from different, uh, I think, uh, perspectives and uh, that we must have spoken to each other about. Since you mentioned uh, Prime Minister Kishida's, I don't know whether I'd call it a policy statement, but a speech, then just travelling back in time again to 2007, uh, then Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and the confluence of two C speeches to Parliament, that was so many years later, so path-breaking, so forward-looking. How do you see uh, the two, you know, meshing in terms of the current Prime Minister and uh, Prime Minister Abe? Right. So, I think right at the beginning of his speech yesterday, and I was there for it, um, Prime Minister Kishida recalled the fact that the concept of this whole Indo-Pacific was born in Delhi in 2007. Uh, when um, uh, Prime Minister Abe addressed the joint sessions of Parliament as spoke of the Conference of the Two Seas. And then this was, of course, uh, later formulated in 2016, took birth as the FOIP Free and Open Indo-Pacific. 
So there are those basic principles which have continued. What ha is happening now, I think, is, and it always happens, that, you know, nothing is static. So yeah. you find that there is a churn in different areas. I mean, it's not only political, it's geoeconomics, there are all kinds of new challenges. And I think Prime Minister Kishida is saying that maybe now it's time to relook, reiterate the basic principles which remain unchanged. The challenges in the region remain unchanged, so they are there, so you reiterate them. But in addition, I think you take on board the new challenges which are there. Of course, uh, in his case, perhaps uh, the challenges that he mentioned, and you talk about Ukraine, uh, which the G7 and Prime Minister Kishida and Japan have been uh, giving uh, a lot of importance and priority to. Um, so that is as they see it. But for us, we have a lot of other regional challenges that are there. Some old time challenges which continue. And you know, when you, you know very well what challenge we, uh, we uh, as India, uh, that we face from our, in our neighbors. Master, in Japan itself, there's a huge change that is coming about, whether it's in terms of their defense budget or what they're proposing to do there. India and Japan are also upping tempo. Let's say we had uh, the exercises with the Indian Air Force pilots first first time traveling to. That would probably have been interesting with the Sukhois and the Japanese being able to gauge how the Chinese would be using the Sukhois with a woman pilot, I think, also. But yeah. in terms of defense and what was mentioned in the joint statements and the outcomes of increased cooperation, co-production, Things like that were talked about, though Foreign Secretary said no specific projects were. Yeah. How do you see that developing? Well, certainly, if you look, uh, one of the areas where our cooperation has grown hugely is in the area of defense. Yeah. Uh, but let me just go back to what you first said. Yes, Prime Minister Kishida has uh, enunciated his own national security strategy. The last one was by Prime Minister Abe in 2012. There are many very interesting elements in this. In fact, I think. Japan is coming out of some of these sort of, uh, you know, positions in which it had placed itself because of its history and it's looking out. And there, in, uh, India certainly has a, a big role to play. Now, you find that uh, I heard foreign secretaries uh, also yesterday at his press conference where he talked about the importance of cooperation in defense technologies and equipment, where he talked about the need to co-innovate, uh, co-design and co-create. Now, this is something that I think we take very seriously, that we will work together. We will work together in design, we will work together to manufacture, and we will work together to also be able to export to the world. So this is a part of Atmanir Bharata, as he said, and we are looking for it in defense, but we are going to do this with other countries. And we see Japan also in light of its new policies. I think there are a lot of more opportunities here. And uh, this, the fact that our prime minister stressed that, and uh, you know, and uh, Japan with its new uh, new NSS, the new security strategy, I do believe that there will be convergences, and we will see far more than has happened because we have had these agreements over time on defense equipment and technology, and somehow there is a bit of a feeling that um, it hasn't delivered as much as we would have liked it to. And yes, when you talked about um, you know the um, joint exercises, the naval exercises were they started some time ago, and we also had uh, you know, land exercises. But I think this is the first time we've had a full-fledged air exercise called Beer Guardian, I think yeah. it's called. And uh, yeah, so you see that on that hand, definitely, and also with the signing of the AXA. So our defense and security cooperation has certainly been growing very, very steadily. And within Japan, Master, since you still follow it extremely closely, both what's happening there and with your contacts who you managed to meet as well. The NSS, the, the whole... Taiwan issue, how do you see Japan reacting if push comes to shove and China tries to use force? Would that straitjacket that you said Japan had put itself and the West had also put it into change in terms of uh, being involved in anything that needs to counter China? You know, it's very difficult to predict, but there are certain things that one can see. For one, that the people and you've got to carry the people with you in a democracy, had no appetite to go, you know, after their terrible history of the war. They were quite happy with the self-defense forces, uh, you know, uh, uh, a position that they had. What I was reading was, when this NSS was coming about, that there is far more support now, particularly in view of what could happen in Taiwan, 
for uh, Japan to come out of this you know, self-imposed trade jacket in a way as it is and take a more active role. As you know, the allied partners have been telling them to take more of a burden. So apparently, so they are able to carry their people, that's one. What can happen with Taiwan? There have been several, uh, you know, statements. Um, and what do you do see is that certainly anything happens inside uh, Taiwan will be something very, very, uh, which will affect the core interests of Japan. I mean, this is very clear. Uh, what is very obvious to anyone who knows is America has bases there, right? You have American bases there. And American bases, particularly in this Okinawa, uh, you know, the archipelago, the Nanse Islands are very close to Taiwan. So can Japan really stay out of it? And I think they have those concerns which they are voicing. Uh, obviously, nobody would like to get into a war which would cause destruction both sides, you know. Um, so now they're also, if you see one interesting part of the NSS was its counterattack yeah. uh, capability, right. thing, which is something they wouldn't have talked about. So, I mean, they have made it very clear that it's, they wouldn't, it wouldn't be the first, they would not be the first. But in case it happens, uh, you know, that they should have counterattack uh, capabilities. And uh, this, again, is anticipating what is going to happen in their immediate region. And it's not only, you're not only looking at Taiwan, you're also looking at North Korea. Yeah. On, bilateral, on the bilateral front, I think semiconductors was another issue, which is, again, interesting. Both parties, actually, the whole world. Yeah. And a lot of uh, figures that have been put out there in terms of uh, whether it's aid or FDI, huge numbers that you're talking about, even the target that was set last year. Yeah. How much is that moving? How much is it fructifying? So what had happened was in 2014, when Prime Minister Modi uh, made his first visit yeah. to Japan, uh, there had been a commitment of 3 trillion yen over a period of five years in public and private investment and finance. That happened. So a lot of this might have been in the JICA related projects because you know they're huge infrastructure projects, but there's also been some amount of slow growth of FDI, slower than as I say, again, we would like. Now, again, last year when uh, Prime Minister Kishida came, he talked about 5 trillion yen now over a period of five years. So I think there are large figures that we are talking about. Um, as far as semiconductors are concerned, uh, you know, the whole thing is about the supply chain and not being overly dependent on one source and being able to diversify supply chains. Resilience, the concept of resilience means that we have to diversify. And certainly uh, Japan has the technology, it has the finances, it's, you know, basic King many partners, but I think Japan would be a leading partner. And therefore, I think our Prime Minister put it on the table as something of great priority to us. Um, along with other issues, I think he also talked about issues such as, um, you know, renewable energy, yeah. energy transition and so on. These are uh, issues which are important to us. And after the pandemic, um, you know, subjects like global health, where we could work together. And talking about these large figures, again, Prime Minister Kishida is talking about 75 billion for the Indo-Pacific. Uh, is that a realistic alternative to what the Chinese are offering the region? Or is I that suppose, what it's targeting at least? Yes, I think so. Because you see, this is again not the first time the Japanese are yeah. talking about it. I think way back in 2015 also, they talked about um, building uh, infrastructure. But I think they called it, qualified it by saying, you know, that the in, it would be different from the way the Chinese were going about it. That the funding would not be opaque. and you know, There would be certain standards and, you know, this would be actually... The whole uh, idea would be that, you know, you would not get countries into debt. Um, so they had uh, talked about it. And this is a continuation. This is part of what he sees as a new vision uh, for the Indo-Pacific, where he has talked about. And this is interesting. We talked about the global south. So much of what he talks about, but he talked about yesterday uh, in his speech was about inclusivity of uh, countries with you know diverse histories and cultures and how to make this FOIP something that is flexible, that has space for everybody. And you look at the development needs of those countries. And in that context, of course, he talked about the 75 billion yen uh, till 2030. He also talked about some focus areas in Asia, you know, which the Japanese would be looking at. And very interestingly, one was, of course, Southeast Asia, and we know their engagement with Southeast Asia is fairly historical. But the other area that he talked about was Northeast India, and uh, Bangladesh and the Bay of Bengal and South Asia in general. Uh, so, and of course, then the third was the Pacific Island states, which have become very important in the contestation of geopolitics now. But interestingly, so, you know, they've also identified the areas um, or the, the regions where, the, where perhaps uh, they would like to invest. 
and in different forms of, I think, one thing nice about the Japanese, I must say, is very often that our own experience in India is that they have been willing to invest in areas of priority to us. So it's a consultation mechanism by which it happens. And in this way, they sometimes uh, differentiate themselves from other traditional donors. Do you want to elaborate a little bit more? And it's not just the Northeast. I think they have some power projects in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, which are again strategic. So uh, what, do, what do both sides gain from this? And theoretically, I know what, what's happening. Well, I think uh, I like to say this. My own interpretation is that it's really a matter of trust. Because these are really a very, um, in terms of uh, fragile peripheries, in sensitive peripheries for us from security point of view, whether it's the Andamans or it's the Northeast. And so we're very careful whom we partner with. There are historic reasons for that. And uh, Japan is really our chosen partner there, whether it's in the Andamans and you have the undersea cables now of, uh, to the Andamans. You have some renewable energy projects there and the Northeast, of course, is infrastructure. They're then a variety of areas in the Northeast. And it's interesting because what uh, Prime Minister Kishida said yesterday was that the, since the Northeast is, la is landlocked, they would like to link it uh, through Bangladesh in a way uh, to the Bay of Bengal. But of course, this is, you know, this gives opportunities for both Bangladesh and for India. I mean, it's not something only for the Northeast. And even earlier, it's very much part of our Act East policy because we were looking to link through Bangladesh to the Bay of Bengal, through Myanmar, unfortunately. I mean, uh, I think the situation there has certain limitations right now, but through Myanmar to Southeast Asia. So very much part of our, uh, of our Act East policy. And you perhaps know that we have an Act East forum uh, which is there between Japan and India. It's chaired by the Japanese ambassador in Delhi and our foreign secretary. And that means periodically. I think yesterday, uh, Foreign Secretary Vinay Quatra said it would be meeting the end of next month. So we look at the projects that we do. So basically, it's really, it's um, a trusted partner, you know, that whom we have worked with. And I think we have, you know, converging interests also in that region. So it works well for both sides. In your reading, um, how is China reacting to all these developments, especially closer that India is getting to Japan, to the US, the Chinese and the Russians are ha having naval exercises in that area when Nancy Pelosi came and the Chinese reacted. Some of, I think, the almonds fell into the EZ in uh, uh, Japan. So how do you see the Chinese reacting to all of this? Well, you know, they've talked about it. If you see, of course, AUKUS, they've been very, very clear, uh, you know, in their denunciation. But in terms of quad, they've talked in terms of not having these clubs, which are, you know, exclusive and you know, target other countries and so on. And so, of course, they couldn't be really happy with it at all. And that is important because I think it was our prime minister who brought in the idea of inclusivity, saying that, OK, if you adhere to these basic rules and principles, you know, and, you know, then anybody is welcome. But there are some basic principles, which also yesterday Kishida enunciated, saying that there has to be some basic respect to the, you know, the rule of law, um, respect to sovereignty, territorial integrity, uh, no unilateral, uh, you know, change of status quo through force. And these are some fundamental principles. And, you know, if you're on board, then we can have a common, uh, I think, stand among countries in the region. And since you mentioned AUKUS, do you see any... Japanese uh, role in AUKUS uh, or enlargement or need or necessity at all? You know, right now what I understand is no. Yeah. That's the, that's the, there were people who were talking about the possibilities and there even there were people, I think, um, analysts were talking about uh, from AUKUS to JOKUS, but it wasn't, yeah. wasn't there. Right now, of course, as you see, you've seen what has happened recently, uh, you know, when the, uh, the, the, the Australians and the US and the UK have met together. It's, it's a really long term, you know, sort of, uh, it's going to be a project that's going to take some time. And right now, I don't think there is space for others. Ambassador Wadwa, as usual, thank you so much for sharing your time and your experience and hosting us in your lovely home. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Amitabh. Always. Thank you pleasure so much. All our ambassador. Thank you. And to our viewers, do hit the thumbs up button on YouTube if you like this video. Do share the link as widely as possible. Follow our social media handles. There's a telegram scroll at the bottom of your screen if you join our Telegram channel, you'll get updates when we put it on them up either on our website or on our YouTube site for interviews like this with Ambassador Deepa Gopalan Badwa. This is Stat News Global. I'm Amitabh Reddy.